So this year, there's a bunch of rule changes you need to know about. First of all, the targeting rule. Every targeting play will be reviewed, and no longer will they be able to come back and say the call stands. They will either say it is confirmed or overturned. There will no longer be a gray area. There's also more punishment coming down. If one player commits three targeting fouls in the same season, they get an added one-game suspension. Also, a blindside block is no longer allowed. That's a 15-yard penalty. And you remember that seven-overtime bonanza that happened in the SEC last year? Well, it's going to be different this year. You get four overtimes the way we're used to. But if it goes to a fifth overtime, then it's just two-point plays that you're alternating instead of the 25-yard line. Okay, for more details on all this, we check in now out at the Hilton in Chicago with Bill Carollo, who's the coordinator of football officials for the league. After spending two decades as an NFL official, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, the opportunity to be here with you today. Uh, a couple things I'd like to cover. Uh, number one, uh, 2019 is an off year for rule changes. And the only time we'll make changes to a rule, unless it has to do with player health and safety, and there's five significant areas this year that we made changes to. I want to cover those uh, quickly and then I'll give us a little more time in the Q&A area if you want to dive into it a little bit deeper and we have a breakout session afterwards that can cover the new rules in detail. Um, the player health and safety, number, maybe the most important one is the targeting area. We've made a couple changes in targeting that are significant. All elements of targeting have to be confirmed, meaning that there won't be a stands. The ruling on the field last year, if, it, if we weren't sure, the play would stand and that player would be disqualified. This year, all elements have to be confirmed. If not, the player stays in the game. That might be about 10% of plays last year. Based on the numbers last year, we'll have 10% possibly less targeting calls this year. And here's the idea behind it and the thinking, the rationale, is we want to get this play correct. It's a very important play as far as health and safety, but it's also the penalty is our largest penalty. So we want to make sure that we get that correct. And if we aren't sure, the player will stay in the game. On the flip side of it, if a player commits three targeting fouls in one season, we call this a progressive penalty. He'll be disqualified for that game uh, when he commits his third targeting call, but he also will sit out one full additional game. It's a pretty heavy penalty. So we're going to be working uh, with the teams and with the players, especially after they get the first one, and we're going to give them warnings. But if they end up with the, th the third targeting penalty, it will have to be a progressive penalty and one full game from there. The next area that we made a change to is two-man wedges. About four or five years ago, we got rid of the three-man wedge. And our data tells us, and we, we uh, collaborated with the NFL as well as with the FBS games, that Two-man, three-man wedges are very, very dangerous. Number one, kickoffs, when we have those wedge plays, are our most dangerous play as far as injuries, and we get a lot of concussions trying to break up that two-man wedge. So when two players intentionally come together to form a wedge, it'll be a 15-yard penalty for an illegal wedge block. The only exceptions to that rule is if we have a, an obvious onside kick, the kickoff goes out of bounds, there's a fair catch, involved on the on the kickoff or if the ball goes in the end zone it'll be a touchback so we're going to eliminate that type of play there the third area is blind side blocks you cannot with force attack an opponent and put a block on that player in open space that will be a, considered a blind side block a 15 yard penalty and that's a new rule this year so you can't really deplete people a lot of times you see it on kickoffs change of possessions, interceptions, punt returns. Um, you have to make sure that player sees you and he can defend himself, otherwise it'll be a penalty. Blocking below the waist, we've made a lot of changes in the last 10 years. This is a minor change, but we want to align uh, Team B fouls. Team B is the defense. Team A is the offense, as far as officiating terms are concerned. And now Team B low blocks mirror exactly what the uh, low blocks are for the Team A. So that's a good change. And the last area has to do with overtime. No changes to overtime until we get to the fifth overtime. Last year we had one game in, the, in FBS, seven overtimes. And the year before we had another one of the seven. When you get over 250 plays in a game, it's dangerous to the player's health. So when we get to the fifth overtime, we're not going to put the ball at the 25-yard line. Everything remains the same in the first four. 
We're going to give them extra timeouts between uh, the second and the fourth overtime. But when we get to the fifth, we're going to move the ball from the 25-yard uh, line down to the three-yard line, and they're going to have one shot at scoring a touchdown from there. All right, so we're going to try to, we, we, want, we don't want it, the game to end in a tie, but we want the game to keep moving, you know, and we want it to end uh, once we get to that point. So those are the major changes as far as uh, um, rule changes are concerned. Let me just touch on, before we open it up to, for some questions, a little bit about our program and where we're at. Uh, the Big Ten's been around a long, long time, you know, 100 and some years from the 1800, 1896. Uh, longest standing conference. We've done a lot of really good things in the Big Ten, teams wise, team wise, championship wise, um, student athlete wise, et cetera. And I'm a firm believer that we've done a wonderful job on the officiating side, um, and we've done that for a long time. I'm not talking about during my tenure, but for the last 40, 50 years, under the leadership of Jim Delaney, who's a, more of a hands on football person. Most people don't know that, but Jim is very involved excuse me, very involved in football, and he understands it, and, he, and he, he cares about the student athletes, and he cares about the integrity and the fairness of the rules, and we've done a lot. And maybe the biggest number one gift that he gave our officials was replay 15 years ago in 2004. He led the country uh, in bringing uh, college uh, NCAA football with replay, and that's been great. So technology is emerging, emerging, changing the game. We have a lot of changes around us. You heard from the coaches the last two days, all the changes that are coming around their game and how the schemes and the game's going from three yards and a cloud of dust to a lot of passing and so on. We have to adjust to that. But I would say the technology in this area, the replay, has helped us a lot. Now, there's a lot of other things going on in technology that help. Uh, I may be more of a traditionalist. Um, I think it's, you know, it's still blocking and tackling and winning and getting the calls correct and giving them a fair shot at that. Um, but we're always open to look at technology. And I've made, personally made trips in the last 24 months um, to all the professional um, headquarters, the, the NBA, the NHL, um, uh, Major League Baseball, as well as the NFL, to see what they're doing with technology. So best practices, learning what they're doing, how they're doing, how they're training, um, how they're trying to get the calls right, et cetera. So we're listening. We're talking to all the other uh, collegiate conferences out there, what they're doing with command centers, and so on and so forth. We feel we're, we like what we're doing today. You know, and it may be a little old-fashioned. We like to use the technology where it fits, and replay technology is there to fix the egregious errors, not fix every single mistake. Uh, so we're concerned about the length of games out there, but the technology certainly can help us. But certainly we are uh, going around and listening and seeing what's out there because we want to continue to improve, give the best program, best officiating program to our players, our coaches, and our fans. So that's out there. But the, you know what? Even with the greatest technology, never been a perfect game. There's mistakes by players, by coaches, and, of course, officials. And I've documented several times when we make five or six mistakes every single game and I told you I like what we're doing I like our people I would say today our officiating staff is as strong as it's ever been in my last 10 years the 10 years that I've been here and I've been associated with the um, the Big Ten Conference since the late 70s started full-time in 1980 and it's never been as good and, and the, our officials today are way better when than when I was on the field in the 80s um, there's really three core principles, core uh, fundamental principles that we have in officiating. I want to make it as simple as possible. You know, first of all, it's our training program. Secondly, it's integrity. And third is accountability. I want to just touch on each of those categories because I think it's important to note that, you know, it sounds pretty basic, but we need really good training. And the Big Ten provides the technology, the people, the resources, the budgets to give our officials maybe the best training in the country. And I benchmark them against all the professional sports. So I really like what we're doing in training. But we probably spend more time on the training side to find the right candidates, getting the right skill sets for people on the field, finding the right skill set people that are in the replay booth. They're totally different. And we spend a lot of time on the front end vetting all the people, all the candidates that come to us. And our bar is set really, really high. As far as if you want to come into the Big Ten and be an official in the Big Ten, it's set really high. And I think we have a much better chance to be successful if we get the right people in the program. So a lot of the things that we do, we give them um, um, wonderlick tests, you know, to check their aptitude and, and, and their intelligence. We give them personality tests. We give them battery of written tests. We give them video tests. We do online interviews, and by the time they come in, I, my first question, I always ask them, well, why, why do you want to be an official, men and women that come in that 
apply into the Big Ten. And the number one answer is our training program. So I feel pretty good about what we're doing on the training side, and that's really important. It sounds old-fashioned, roll up the sleeves, you know, blue collar, but you gotta work. You gotta work really hard to get to that level. And then, if you can make it, that's great. And when I take a look at the training program uh, that people that have come in, when I took over, and I took over one of the greatest programs in the country, the, under the leadership of Jim Delaney, his, his, his vision, whether it's technology or getting the right people, Dave Perry had the most respected officiating program in the country. So it's hard to take over an icon like that, Dave Perry. But we wanna get a little bit better. That's what we've been doing. Uh, the second area that we've put a lot of focus on is integrity. If there's any gray area in our game, and if I had to measure our, my officials on one particular thing, it's integrity. And once we lose that integrity, we've lost the game. It really would crush the game, integrity. So we put a lot of time in that area. And if any, I mean, we have fans that call me all the time and say these officials are favoring this team versus another team and so on. And any accusation is credible as far as I'm concerned. We look at it, we check the source, and we try to document uh, what they're trying to uh, say. But the reality is when something like that happens, my first reaction is report it up to the commissioner. We get outside people to look into it, investigate it. And if it, we need be, we'll bring it right to the FBI. That's how serious this is. And I ask my officials, they have to sign a, a contract every year, an expectations letter, and that's exactly what's in there. You know, what, what they do on the field is really, really important. We want to get the calls right. What they do off the field is equally as important. So it's, they have to have the capability when they come in. They have to keep improving, but they have to have the right character, and that's the integrity element that we look for. And the last is really accountability. We want accountability for myself. If we, we, if we make mistakes on the, in the game, I'll take full responsibility. I trained them. Our, our staff put them out there. We assigned them full responsibility there. At the same time, these officials are graded on every single play throughout the year. And there's candid, confidential conversa conversation with all the coaches, with the ADs, with the administrators, um, as high as the presidents of each university. Jim Delaney is involved in that with, with myself. And that uh, confidential conversation is really, really important, a candid conversation with the teams. And that's what builds trust between us. We don't go public with these evaluations uh, for a lot of, lot, lot of reasons. I know people are experimenting with that. But th we feel that what we do internally is important. Now, like I said, there's never been a perfect game. If we make a mistake and we give five downs and it's a winning touchdown, that's not a good thing. We're, we're going public and we're going to acknowledge those errors. But their judgment calls and every single game, uh, some tough calls. The coaches will get the answers. Um, I may tell the media, and a lot of you will text me or call me, what do you think? And off the record, I'll tell you that you know we, we like the call, we don't like the call. But that's a really important area that accountability for my officials uh, is critical. And our officials know it's hard to get in and it's easy to get, get bounced out from that standpoint. So a lot of things are going on in, in the program. We try to manage it. Uh, I don't want to say the old fashioned way, but it's a lot of hard work, um, a lot of dedication. They put more time in it than they ever have, way more time than when I did it when I came into the Big Ten. Uh, and we're really satisfied. When I take a look at all the elements, when I look back, you know, when I talk about the recruiting, the training program, our evaluation program, the accountability, and those con candid conversations with our ADs and our coaches is really critical, really important for our success. So with that, let me, let me stop there. I know we can't satisfy everybody on the field, uh, but certainly I want you to know that I'm really pleased with our staff, what they're doing today, and how hard they're working. And I'll stop here and open it up for some questions. We'll start here in the front. Uh, Noah Kaufman, Inside and You. Can you expand a little bit uh, what you're talking about with targeting? What kind of takes it over the borderline from being a stands call to being a confirmed call? Like, can you give an example of that, where, where it takes from being stands to being confirmed? Sure, really good question. It's really important. We spend probably most of my time on targeting. And every year, I, and there are toughest calls, and I always take them to our meetings with our coaches. We vote on it, and we don't get 14 to 0 that's targeting or not targeting. It's split a lot of times 7 to 7 you know, what they're looking for. So there's a lot of gray area in, in this area. It's got, it's, it has to have some indicators. They have to launch, they have to thrust upward, they have to attack, um, they, they have to use the crown of their helmet or hit a defenseless player above their shoulders. So 
those are the, the basic, that's black and white, that's pretty easy to understand, but it's gotta be forcible contact in an attacking manner that's more than just playing the ball, you know, make, uh, making a tackle, making a block, okay? So it has to be more than that. Uh, and not that we're just saying, you know, years ago when we put this rule in, it, well, that's just football, they're, you know, they're taking the, the big hits away from it, the players. But when, the, when we aren't sure, the rule said, we threw the flag on the field, the rule said the call is gonna stand unless you can overturn it with, beyond all doubt, okay? So if we don't have the right angle, we aren't really sure is that enough force, we'd say the play stands. And we'd go with the call in the field, which is the, pro the right answer. We had too many marginal calls, too many ticky-tack fouls, too many on the margin, just on the edge, that, boy, they could, they could have passed on that. Well, we're gonna get rid of that. Now it's gonna be tougher for my officials, especially in replay. Either it is or it isn't, and I think that's important. So we might have a few less. We're not backing away from it. We tell our guys, when in doubt, throw the flag. Replay has technology, excellent technology, slow motion, just like you have you know, at your homes or during the game. You can see it. So you talk about transparency. There's clearly trans, everyone sees it immediately. You see it before my officials see it. But we are telling the officials, throw the flag, replay, your job to fix it. And it's gonna be tough, because we're getting rid of it. As an example, last year we had no target calls in the Big Ten that stood. I was kind of advocating this the last couple of years. Either make it a targeting call or let them stay in the game. And that's what we've done now nationally, we've made that real change.